right. Welcome everybody to subspecialty rounds. Seems oxymoronic that we call it subspecialty rounds and it's comprehensive rounds, but thus it is. Uh, we'll, we'll, we're just gonna spend some time talking about cataracts. It makes us feel like specialists. Although we have Dr. Chai presenting, he's a glaucoma specialist, so he, he knows what that feels like. All right, uh, today I'm gonna start with uh, one case here. I uh, haven't seen this in a long time, had a recent case, and so I thought there would be a good opportunity to present and also dig into it a little bit to see if there's anything new out there um, with regard to persistent corneal edema after routine cataract surgery. Uh, this case, uh, patient is a 95-year-old female, um, reduced vision with specific complaints about difficulty reading, and so that's why we signed her up for surgery. Her ocular history was otherwise unremarkable. Uh, she had no past history of trauma or other prior ocular surgery. You see her best spectral corrective uh, visual acuities were about 2050 in both eyes. Uh, otherwise pretty normal exam, pupils normal, confrontation fields, uh, EOMs, I IOP, all in the normal range and no, uh, no remarkable abnormalities in that regard. Her pre-op slit lamp and uh, fundus exam uh, had some mild arcus of the cornea, but it was otherwise clear there were no guttata or other uh, issues. Uh, deep uh, chamber, normal iris, lens about three to four plus NS, as you would anticipate in a uh, you know, 95 year old uh, who had not had uh, phaco in the past. Uh, a DFE, normal exam, normal nerve macula, et cetera. So good visual potential based on the exam. So our assessment, of course, visually significant cataract with uh, you know, functional impact on reading. Plan was for cataract surgery. Uh, given the density, uh, a few adjustments that I typically make in these cases, we'll use viscoats as the viscoelastic, try and help protect the corneal endothelium. Uh, we'll use a balance tip with our Alcon Centurion machine to try and improve the efficiency of uh, nuclear removal, reduce the amount of fake energy required for that, and then often use a burst mode. I'm just plugged in. Technical difficulties, hold. <laughs> okay. Sure. Uh, okay, how do I do this? Uh, just log into Mini Master Control. Log into Zoom and then just uh, make it home page to the um, moderator. Intro. Meanwhile, uh, while we have everyone, I uh, just want to uh, do a reminder that we do have our resident uh, graduation this Friday. Um, resident and fellow will be honoring, of course, residents and fellows uh, during this event. Uh, I, I don't know any details, although I understand this could be a roast to remember. Uh, all the subtle smirks and smiles of the residents as uh, at least anyone that's seen it, uh, apparently this one could be legendary. So. Uh, I'm 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 doing what you generally shouldn't do, which I'm raising our expectations for it ahead of time, knowing that it's actually going to deliver uh, deliver on that. A uh, couple couple other announcements: we do have our medical students who are going to be coming through soon. Uh, when our medical students come through, um, they are you know amazing. Just want to echo Judith's words, please make sure and write down your thoughts, impressions, uh, and then send those right away. That really is the best way to get uh, get your thoughts together when they're uh, fresh at the top of mind because they all do look pretty similar uh, later. And then Megan, if you can just make him a, a co-chair, co-moderator so he can screen share just so that he can do that. And, and you don't need to join on. All right, thank you. And so again, just a reminder, please write down uh, notes and impressions uh, for the applicants. Uh, we will have an after interview open house, just like we did last year in January, but that'll be our only time to meet uh, our virtual applicants, those interviewing virtually. Thanks, Bill. All right. 
I came early and set this up, but I uh, did not set it up properly. So thanks, Jeff. So back to the case. Um, I promise you didn't miss anything on those slides. They weren't very exciting. Uh, everything I read was exactly what was on there. Uh, so again, our plan is for cataract surgery. We talked about some of the adjustments we might make with this FACO machine and some of the instrumentation we might use just to try and make things a little bit more efficient. Uh, and of course, with somebody that's uh, over the age of 89, we talk about independent risks for uh, complications related to surgery. Uh, obviously, with the density of the lens specifically, uh, we did talk a little bit about the increased risk of corneal edema, uh, you know, persisting for a little bit longer than typical, you know, with denser lenses with her age. Move to the next slide here. So we'll go. All right, so the actual case was uneventful, uh, uncomplicated. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I thought it was uh, a little bit smoother than I would have anticipated with that level of density of the lens. Um, her post-op, early post-op visits, you can see you know, significantly reduced best spectral corrective acuity at 2040. The example is otherwise pretty unremarkable other than the substantial corneal edema. So it's 24, uh, pupil was normal, IOP was normal. Um, the cornea, of course, showed substantial edema. There was no microcystic changes, just uh, decimate folds with uh, a thickening of the stroma. Gracie was deep informed with about one plus cell, no fiber, no hypopion. Her iris was, was round and reactive. The posterior chamber lens was well centered, well positioned. Uh, so our assessment is we got a significant post-op corneal edema. So we continue, of course, the prednisolone. I had an aqueous suppressant just to try and help support the endothelium uh, by minimizing any pressure uh, associated uh, impact on its functionality, although the IOP was pretty normal uh, here in this case. And, you know, in cases with uh, significant corneal edema, there may be benefit to measuring with a device other than our typical Goldman applination tonometer because that can create a little reduction in the measurements uh, because of the corneal edema. So you may, may need to add a few points in your head uh, if that's the way that it was measured. And then we were gonna follow up in a couple of weeks to see if we were seeing improvements. In terms of the differential, uh, you know, with this amount of corneal edema, obviously we're thinking about a number of different things. So pass as was described here in Grand Rounds just a few weeks ago, uh, you know, pretty substantial edema, but usually you're going to be seeing, you're going to see a more significant anterior chamber uh, reaction in terms of inflammation, which we did not see in her case. Uh, doesn't mean that it wasn't maybe a variation of TAS, but uh, you know certainly wasn't presenting in that classic, uh, you know, very high, very significant infl infl inflammatory reaction scenario. Um, Gutatilis or gutatilis endothelial dysfunction. This was described in the early 90s. Uh, in the literature, uh, or you know, potentially you miss the gutata, you can always look at the other eye to see if that is the potential case. In her case, uh, there were no gutata. Uh, there's always the possibility of a retained lens fragment, though usually that's more focal in terms of the edema, usually the lower or inferior cornea, and you, usually you can uh, you know, see a small fragment in the inferior angle. Sometimes you have to do gonioscopy to identify it. And that's typically something that will show up a few weeks after surgery, usually as you're uh, tapering off of the anti-inflammatory, that, that in, the inflammation will show up and the edema will show up. Uh, and ophthalmitis, obviously, typically more severe uh, AC cell and uh, vitreous inflammatory reaction, more pain, uh, none of which she was having. Uh, you can, of course, see this with a high pressure postoperatively. We look for microcystic changes to sort of suggest that that's the case or that that's present. Uh, as we talked about measuring with a toner pen or some other device other than the Goldman applination tonometer to get our best, uh, most accurate measurement of the IOP. Uh, an iatrogenic decimase membrane detachment also could present this way. Uh, you expect to see more bolus edema uh, in, in that case. Um, and so again, in, in her case, uh, it appeared to be essentially a just significant postoperative uh, you know, probably phaco emulsification injury, maybe a gutatilis endothelial dysfunction based on her presentation. Move forward here. So my working diagnosis, uh, you know, again, phaco induced endothelial dysfunction possible. This is a endothelial dysfunction case without gutata. We haven't done 
or had not to this point done endothelial cell counts, we wouldn't know for sure. Uh, so we're, uh, the, the plan, of course, is to continue to allow time for recovery. Uh, we've just postponed surgery on the other eye until uh, this has had a chance to recover and we're stable. We know what we need to do uh, with that first eye to, to help her see better. Uh, we've got her on PRED, a BID. We stopped her topical NSAID after four weeks. Uh, aqueous suppress, and I continued that for the first six weeks. Her last IOP was 12, and thus uh, we discontinued that. Uh, and at eight weeks, her edema is still grading out moderate, about two plus. We've seen some clinical improvement, but it is persisting. So now what? Uh, obviously, this can be frustrating for a surgeon and for a patient, uh, you know, waiting for this uh, to recover. Uh, in my experience, I don't have a ton of cases that have had this particular uh, presentation, but in my experience, it tends to recover if you give it enough time. And so we try to preach patience, uh, obviously easier to do if you're not dealing with it. Uh, we continue uh, PRED at a low dose at twice daily. In terms of assessing uh, the other eye and trying to figure out what might be going on and preparing or planning potentially for surgery in the other eye, a uh, number of things that we can do. Uh, we can look at the endothelial cell count in the other eye to see if there's any abnormalities in terms of the cell count, the morphology uh, of the cells as well, to see if it's suggestive of endothelial dysfunction or deutotalous endothelial dysfunction. We can do an anterior segment OCT to look a little more in detail at the eye that uh, is recovering to see if there are any abnormalities that uh, might be suggestive of an etiology uh, for the condition. If the edema does not clear uh, within a few months, obviously we can involve our cornea specialty services uh, to talk about whether uh, a DSEC or DMEC would be indicated and, and timing on that. Uh, in terms of the other eye, whether you do a combined procedure, I think that would be, of course, based on whether there was evidence of significant endothelial dysfunction driving uh, this persistent corneal edema, in which case maybe a combined case would make sense. Uh, you know, other alternative or experimental treatments, I didn't find much in the literature. There was one paper on transcorneal oxygenation, which did show, uh, you know, some improvement in terms of central corneal thickness as a, a marker for the effect from that versus no treatments. Uh, but other than that, there's really not much change out there. <laughs> and it wasn't great, but not much out there in terms of, uh, you know, differences there. Uh, so, Unfortunately, did not find anything uh, earth shattering or new that, that we could add to this case. And again, it is, it is recovering gradually. So the expectation is we'll continue to see uh, improvements that will likely take a number of months. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments on this particular case? Randy and then Nick. Uh, no, I mean that, yeah, that's the other thing that I came across. Like this, so the first is this 
try to get that out is about 20, 30 cultures. We've got that series of work that, uh, that, you know, that we did, and Billy and I, you know, took, took the lead in putting that together and it went forward. And we pointed out that the Palestine and Jews are an issue, a part of the Jewish history, but also some of our own Jewish history, Jewish tradition. And it's just whatever we need to kind of baby that along. And uh, that was some success. I think that can show that they're certainly coming together and those people have totally responsibility to do the same thing in their spot. So speculative life prophecy in the other eye. Uh, and you might look at yourself now and go, why would God fly to the Jesus? Uh, it would help you know that what I'm sure is that probably it's just the same thing. Yeah, I, I agree. The, the imaging is definitely planned to look at the other eye, uh, as, you've, as you've noted, try and help us figure out what's going on. Okay. Yeah, some of the rock inhibitors with, uh, you know, when people do the decimate strip and just leave it, uh, you know, to sort of heal secondarily, they use a rock inhibitor to help stimulate that. Worth a try, yeah. Nick, yeah. what he said. <laughs> well, like, Nick's the one who was like, the only thing I would add is, is that only Dr. Olson can actually see Gutatilus Fuchs. Mere mortals can't see that at the sweat lamp, and we don't see that. But this would be a good one to get the pathology on. So if it does go to, to um, DMAC, you know, make sure we get the pathology because we can actually see the diffuse thickening of, of decimase membrane and those little tiny, I don't know what we call them, gutets, you know, that, that, that can show up, micro gutata. And so we'll be able to tell that on there. It'd be interesting to see what the specular microscopy in the other eye looks like. Yeah. The other thing that we found in the past is when I've done specular microscopy every once in a while, I've looked at those corneas, they're crystal clear, everything looks normal, and they'll have a cell count of 600. And you just, every once in a while, you'll get surprised and, and the cells that are there are just functioning you know, barely, barely functioning, keeping that cornea clean. It doesn't take much to put them over the edge. So I think a specular microscopy in the other eye would be helpful to guide you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, just an, an addition on regards to that. I had one of those as well. And, uh, and then when you when you asked afterwards, you said, oh, oh, oh yeah, you know, I, I, I got hit in that eye with a snowball or something. And, so you can get traumatic loss without any obvious sign with very low cell count, and those can be fragile too. So good point, Nick. Yeah. Mark. Hey, Bill. I'm sorry. I did, forgot we were starting at 745, but do you have a, the specular for this eye? I, I don't. No, okay. I, I'm arranging that. If she's a patient from South Jordan. I don't have that out okay. there. So it's arranging to get her up here to, to look at And that. how far out is this? She's person? about two months out. Yeah. I mean, I definitely would stall on EK because a lot oh, of yeah. these eyes yeah. get better. Um, and I think keeping them on low dose steroid is often a good, you know, like pred twice a day does seem to speed recovery. But I think the that's the missing link. I mean, you got to get the cell count on both yeah. eyes. And just just so you guys know, the automated Conan, especially the don't even look at the number, look at the look at the picture. Unless you count the cells individually, um, the automated number is almost always wrong because it's just not it's counting especially if there are gute it's counting those incorrectly um but yeah i mean you definitely see this um uncomplicated easy phaco and then edema you know we see it in glaucoma patients obviously we see slt patients we see that there's definitely you know maybe an inflammatory component as well that's happening and it's an uncertain kind of endothelial, I, I think maybe autoimmune thing that can happen as well, which may not be um, pre-existing. So. I think the last time I had a case like this, a number of years ago, and we shared this patient that had an eye stent with a FACO. That, I mean, her, her lens was denser than this one, another mid nineties, you know, uh, female. Yeah, definitely no question that yeah. angle surgery causes this yeah. corneal decompensation when there's no stripping of decimase directly, there's no reason for it. There's no hypotony, flat chamber, whatever. I mean, I don't know if Norm's here, but over the decades, we've shared multiple, multiple, multiple patients where it seems to be an autoimmune 
kind of process. And so, um, but the, yeah, the specular would be really helpful. Thanks, Mark. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Appreciate all those who have shared. If not, we can. And Dr. Chai is on now. Dr. Chai is on, terrific. We'll turn it over to Craig. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? You can you can screen share, Craig. Sounds good. You can hear me okay, though. Great. Are you guys able to hear from where you're at? Uh, Jeff, I don't know if you can confirm if you can hear my audio. Yeah, audio good and video good. Okay, sounds good. Well, I apologize to everyone for not being there in person. Um, after I managed to go three years evading COVID, and it finally snuck up and got me this weekend. Um, so I'm, I'm out this whole week, and it's definitely not uh, something to toy with. It was, it's was it been rough for the last three days. I'm finally feeling a little bit better today. Uh, but I appreciate your attention. Uh, Bill asked me to present a few cases, some interesting cases, and so I'm going to present two cases, uh, one on a phaco capsulotomy technique and then the 60 polypropylene flange technique. Um, these are my financial disclosures, none relevant to this topic, and I just wanted to highlight to everyone, next month is Alan's birthday, um, his anniversary, or his birthday, and just I want to acknowledge Alan for the work that he's done uh, for our center, his legacy continues to thrive, uh, both within our glaucoma division and as well as our cataract division, uh, reminding us that we need to continue to always uh, look for new and better ways to do things and to be able to challenge norms and uh, to be able to get uncomfortable sometimes. And that's how we progress in the field. Uh, that's how we maintain our edge. And so I just wanted to acknowledge Alan for uh, the incredible impact that he's had on my career and just the legacy that he's left behind, behind our institution. Uh, for our early trainees that are coming through the program now that never had a chance to interact with Alan, uh, I would recommend that you go down to external relations and uh, pick up the issue that was dedicated to Alan, I think a few years ago. Uh, and it's worth it. It's worth the read. I actually have a copy in my office if you'd like to come by and read it. Uh, but it's just a reminder to me uh, of the type of person that he was uh, giving in so many respects and also pushing us to be our very best. So there are many strategies that we use to mitigate the Argentinian flag sign. <clears throat> and so maintaining high anterior chamber pressure is certainly paramount to any of these techniques. We also have the needle decompression. Uh, typically, I would use a 27 gauge uh, one inch needle uh, filled with BSS in a syringe, half filled so that I can draw back the plunger. As soon as I puncture into the capsule, I'm immediately pulling back on the plunger to aspirate the liquefied cortex. Uh, there's also the cortical milking technique um, by Sun Pak Chi in Singapore, uh, which is essentially very similar in the, in the idea that you're milking peripheral, milky cortex out to the peripheral initially, using a highly cohesive viscoelastic to indent the anterior capsule to overcome the intracapsular pressure. Uh, there's also electrocautery with the Zepto unit where you can immediately perform a capsulotomy uh, in just a matter of nanoseconds. Flax has also been considered as an uh, alternative to uh, overcoming the um, Argentinian flag sign. Microforceps, Dr. Olson et al. had published a series of cases uh, using micro as microforceps in order to maintain that high anterior chamber pressure to be able to perform a capsulotomy through small paracentesis incisions rather than through a main incision. And then finally, the phaco capsulotomy technique. Uh, much has been written about this technique from Chris Tang. Uh, I encourage you to read his papers in, in terms of uh, how that technique works. So I'm gonna present this case. Um, it's edited down to about 15 minutes or so. I'm happy to speed it up and pause it as we go along. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that we have absolutely outstanding chief residences here. It's just been a joy to work with all of you. Um, and I'm sorry, I probably won't be able to attend the graduation because I'll be in quarantine still until Saturday. Uh, but I want to give a shout out here to Sean Collin, who was my trainee on this case. Um, he's also the primary surgeon on this case. This is a roughly 58-year-old Caucasian female uh, who presented to me with a white cataract. Uh, ultrasound of the posterior segment was normal. 
And so I'm just going to let the case go here and kind of narrate as we go along. Um, it was difficult for her to fixate and to maintain good um, akinesis, so we went ahead and did a subtenons injection there. Then I'll be using, I just use an optical zone marker to roughly delineate what the capsule rexus will look like. Paracentesis as incisions are made on either side in order to provide adequate access to the anterior chamber at all times. Uh, I'd like to use a small bubble technique for the tripan blue. I'll then inject the vision blue inside and, whoops, let's see what happened with the video here. Um, give me a second here. So there you can see the vision blue being displaced by the viscoelastic. And now a keratome is made, a keratome incision. Now for the keratome incision, uh, as you'll notice in this case, uh, we struggle with the size of the incision. Initially, based on Chris Tang's paper, it was important to maintain high flow throughout the phacocapsulotomy capsulotomy technique. Uh, but maybe I'll pause here for a moment and just leave it up to the audience to chime in about what their standard approach would be and why uh, to overcome this milky cataract. Hey, Craig, it's Nick Mamalis. Um, I learned from Dr. Olson and Dr. Crandall to use the micro incision forceps through a stab incision prior to making the primary incision and using a highly retentive OVD in the anterior chamber to keep that anterior capsule flat and to keep that liquefied cortex pushed down and, and knock wood. Using that technique, I've not seen an Argentinian flag sign now when you've got you don't make the wound because that viscoelastic can burp out the main wound. So you really got to go through the side port incision with the micro utrata forceps. And if you can keep that, you know, disco visc or a highly retentive OVD like that in the anterior chamber and keep that from flattening out, um, you can keep that from extending. You start small and then spiral it out. And, and as I said, using that particular technique, I haven't had an Argentinian flag since then. So, uh, hey, this is, uh, this is Randy. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the big issue here is obviously uh, when you get this intumescent cataract is that you've got increased intracapsular pressure. And uh, we know spontaneous breakage in the face of normal intraocular pressure is, is a, a exceedingly rare event. I'm not only sure if it's been reported, but it's, it's lowering the pressure in the anterior chamber. And, and even though you can put a lot of viscoelastic in the anterior chamber to maintain that pressure with the main incision, and and I've I've seen people with that 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 as soon as it burps out some viscoelastic, boom, there's the Argentina immediately, and that shows that there's a very very high pressure inside that capsule. So just having a you know single small side port, and then uh, with a highly retentive, I mean Helon five was one that would work well. You just don't, aren't going to get you've got enough. You're filling with the capsule rexus forcep that uh, uh, I've just never seen it able to burp out through that small incision. And I'm, I'm with Nick. I mean, I, it's been a while since I've operated, but I certainly did a whole slew of these since I had that series that I reported in JCRS and, and never had it. So I think, I think it's an avoidable complication. And that's certainly the way that I found was most effective. Craig, Craig just one more comment. Um, you know, it's interesting, you know, as we've gone through the years or we've taught residents how to safely, you know, open up the capsule, um, it's it's technically not 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 easy. And and this is one that's that's really interesting. If I think about, you know, if I was if indeed, you know, we could arrive at a place where this is consistent, there is a known and very low rate of complications. Um, this this is what I would call kind of a mere mortal um, being able to go in and just open up a capsule straight away for capsule rexus. Clearly, you have to get the fluidics right. Um, the two times I did this, it worked out well. Um, it still makes me a little uncomfortable only because it's unfamiliar, but uh, I think it's technically certainly easier than than the kind of tried and true you know, methods that Randy and Nick have have outlined. Whether or not it's safer and better long term, that's that's the question. Sounds good. I'll let the video play. I did want to add that I did apply a highly retentive viscoelastic. And now I'm just going to pause for a moment just to highlight the settings 
Uh, and also just to point out a few things, normally I operate through a 2.4 ish incision and I use a pink sleeve on our Centurion FACO platform. Uh, but here I've de decided that I'm going to go through a slightly larger incision and I'm going to use the same needle, um, not, a, not a larger needle, but the same needle. But I'm using the purple sleeve, uh, which should allow for better flow inflow into the eye. I've also cranked up my infusion pressure. Normally, I operate with an infusion pressure or IOP of around 40. Um, in this case, we're, we've ramped it up to about 80 uh, to 90. Uh, so I've got more flow coming into the eye. I've got more flow coming around the needle. And according to Chris Tang in his description, we're using a low vacuum setting. So this is your typical sculpt mode. I'm using somewhere between 80 to 100 millimeters mercury. Um, my standard uh, power settings on my FACO aspiration roughly you know 20 to 25 or so so this is a sculpt setting that i'm using to initiate here or that sean is using to initiate so now the, the technique is such is that you just have to plunge immediately and immediately start aspirating uh, you're combining the idea that you're constantly infusing water into the eye and then you're also uh, aspirating immediately the liquid cortex so here we're bearing in and boom you can see that opening and there's a little tag there and surprising that tag is still maintained uh, Sean is uh, gently aspirating the liquefied cortex, and then he'll actually use the phaco tip and actually finish off the last tag there. Uh, and there you can see just before he withdraws, there's still more liquid cortex. So we're putting highly retentive viscoelastic to maintain the chamber before we come out. Uh, and then now you can see this case almost proceeds relatively normal here. And, you know, in some cases where you feel like there's still a significant amount of pressure inside the eye, uh, you may actually start to see the capsule rexus want to run out. Uh, but I would say for the most part, as Sean is propagating this capsulotomy, uh, it's behaving normal. Uh, there's not a lot of run out. There is still some minor liquefied cortex, as you can see, emanating from the opening. Uh, but we're not seeing any run outs here. And it's very controlled. In hindsight, what some things that I would have done differently I certainly would have used a tighter incision. I, I think I had the wrong keratome that was maybe a three millimeter rather than a 2.75. So it didn't match up nicely throughout the case. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and let this case run and just point out a few other things uh, throughout the case that I think Sean did extremely well. But here you can see we've got a great capsulotomy opening and uh, we'll go back in and we'll start to do our FACO. Uh, as you can see, this is not just your white cataract. It's, it's also brunescent as well. Uh, we're using a standard sculpt setting here. And then we'll actually do kind of a double sculpt. We'll sculpt distally, and then we'll rotate again to be able to get that subincisional a little bit better uh, to be able to get down to the plate. So now I've done a few cases or one more case since this phaco capsulotomy case that I'm showing you here. And now I've just decided to maintain my normal pink sleeve 2.4 millimeter incision. I will ramp up the settings uh, and then allow um, um, the, the needle to immediately penetrate and then aspirate uh, the liquefied cortex. Here we're using, this is a throwback to Alan. Uh, this is a pre-chopper. We just felt like we were, we were able to get better leverage down at the plate because uh, our, our FACO and uh, second instrument weren't able to give us the leverage we needed to be able to crack the plate. So we're using both ends of the pre-chopper here. Uh, the rounded side, we can get all the way down to the plate and touch the plate without risk of perforation through the plate and through the bag. And then now we'll proceed with just our uh, a simple, chop technique here. We're dividing the pieces up. And then Sean's doing a very nice job here of chopping those pieces and maintaining safety. I'll speed up this case. The case went very routine from this point on. Um, one of the things that I had to do throughout the case though is that we had to place some sutures um, because I mentioned to you that I, I used a, a keratome that was not normally in my set. I thought it was a 275, but turned out it was probably closer to a three. And so I had to place some sutures throughout the case to reduce the risk for surge. And uh, so we'll go ahead and just advance here and get down to the last nitty gritty here. So we're down to the last chip. I've placed two, two or three sutures actually to close the wound up to keep it a little bit tighter. We don't have any sleeves larger than the purple sleeve for, for our standard FACOs. Um, so you do have to just place some interrupted sutures to close up the gap and limit the amount of egress of fluid. So polishing, not much to polish in this very dense lens, viscoelastic elastic lens is placed in the bag. And then at the end of the case, I've actually replaced some of the sutures and uh, we'll just place two interrupteds to close this incision. 
because of the density of the nature of the lens, um, that I, I went ahead and injected some dilute triamcinolone, uh, which we use, you know, for vitreous stain. Uh, usually, if I'm planning on injecting it into the anterior chamber for inflammation control, I'll ask uh, our pharmacist to mix it a little bit more concentrated than our standard dilution for vitreous stain. So that is the phaco capsulotomy technique. I've, I've, I was very surprised at how controlled it was, uh, and that by maintaining a high pressure infusion pressure, we're maintaining that uh, anterior chamber space and overcoming intercapsular pressure in order to mitigate against the Argentinian flag sign. Questions before we move on to the next case? So, Comments so or- This is yeah. Dr. Olsen. Uh, I think it's the same concept, really. I mean, you, as long as you're maintaining good pressure inside the anterior chamber and you know, the main incision is being supported by the sleeve and the rest so that you, you're, and then you've got the inflow and, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's, uh, it's great. It's, it's neat. And people don't have to learn how to use a micro capsule forceps. So I think it uh, would probably be very effective. It makes sense. Yeah, I think one of the issues as I've traveled around the world, you know, micro forceps are a, a, a still a luxury item for many parts of the world. Uh, certainly they're used to using, I know Sanduk Ruiz, when I watched him do cataract surgery in Nepal, uh, he was using an um, assistatome on an infusion line. So he essentially was doing the same thing uh, through a micro incision uh, coming. Actually, he didn't even make a paracentesis. He just punctured it in through the peripheral clear cornea, running it through uh, an infusion on an IV pole in order to maintain the chamber space. Um, so I think you can get creative here. If, if you didn't have access to micro utratas and micro forceps, I think this is a reasonable technique to be able to overcome the complexities of uh, chamber shallowing. Hi, Craig, this is Marissa. Um, two questions. C could you just do this with your normal wound size, your keratome and the normal sleeve? Like, I guess, why do you have to change both of those? And then um, could you describe what you're doing with the foot pedal as you enter, are you going into FACO just to break through the capsule and then backing off so you're only aspirating after that? Yeah, so great question. Uh, so to answer your question, after this case, uh, Sean Collin was still on my service and we did another case where I just used my normal pink sleeve, 2.4 incision sleeve, and but I still ramped up the infusion pressure uh, closer to 80 to 90 to really push in more fluid. Uh, I made sure that the incision was tight. Uh, we went in, you know, I think we really tried to keep the incision as as true as po as possible to the particular size of the sleeve to reduce the amount of egress coming around the sleeve. In terms of the foot pedal position, so you're going immediately into FACO 3 as soon as you touch the capsule, and you're maintaining at least into position 2 to be able to asp aspirate the liquefied cortex. Uh, in this case, there was a small little tag uh, that we actually, I don't remember exactly, maybe Sean, if you remember, I, I feel like we just aspirated the tag and then just ripped it off rather than actually fakoing the tag off. So I don't think I used any additional ultrasound power to, to remove the tag, uh, but you definitely would need to maintain position two in order to continue to aspirate the liquefied cortex. Uh, there was also a point in the video where Sean is kind of bouncing the lens in order to try to milk out that liquefied cortex that's behind the lens in order to bring it forward. Hey, Craig, it's Brian Zog on Zoom. Um, so two questions that I have. Do you run risk of wound burn with this technique or is it short enough that you're not worried about that? And then the second question yeah. is, when, when you create that FACO opening, um, what do you do if you create like a perfectly round opening with nowhere to continue or initiate, I guess, a tear to complete the rexus? Yeah, great question. Um, so wound burn, I, at the very beginning, uh, we, although we did use a highly retentive viscoelastic to maintain that space, we did aspirate a little bit above the cortex. Um, I, I'm, I think the risk that we run with a wound burn is if you're fakoing under viscoelastic for a significant amount of time. So we did aspirate a little bit above the, 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 the capsule in order to be working in a dome of BSS rather than just viscoelastic alone. And then um, your other question was about what do we do if we actually need to, if we create a perfectly round rexus? So I'm going to go back to it here and just show you here that that's exactly what we had. We had a perfectly round capsulotomy opening. So we're just aspirating there and then we're ready to plunge. 
and then immediately we're in position two at least to maintain liquefied or to aspirate the liquefied cortex. And there's a tag here still, and we'll remove the tag. And then what we're left with is a perfectly round capsulotomy. So there really was no um, tear for me to then initiate, but as you can see with the utrata forceps here, and I think part of it is also with the tripan blue staining in order to make the capsule just slightly more brittle, we're able to actually just grab the edge and then start the tear. And that was able to be propagated around and successfully completed. Other questions? So I don't think it really matters. We were using a, a fully torsional setting rather than longitudinal. Um, I use, I don't use continuous FACO on my scalp setting. I use a high pulse rate of like 40 pulses per second um, and 100% all torsional power, no longitudinal power at all. Some people feel that I think it would be I guess theoretical that maybe longitudinal might be better because you're just uh, going forward and backward and just really cookie cuttering that capsulotomy rather than going to and fro with the torsional movement. But uh, in this case, we didn't have any issues with any radial tear outs. Okay, we'll move on to the next topic. Um, you know, we live in the land of pseudo exfoliation and it it's just amazing the amount of pathology that comes in our region because of that, both from a glaucoma service as well as uh, late dislocation of IOLs. Um, Nick, I don't know if you I, I forget the statistic in your paper that you and Liliana did a series of patients who had IOL dislocations and post-mortem it, I think it was maybe something like 30 or 40 percent had un or were never categorized as pseudo exfoliation, but post-mortem you were able to see that on staining. Is that true? I don't remember the actual percentage. Maybe uh, the mic's yes. not on for- No, yeah, yeah we got the mic now. Um, we found a very high percentage in the spontaneous dislocation of IOLs in our first study. We found that 50% actually had um, exfoliation, but was interesting got a further large group of, of um, specimens from Northern Germany, from uh, Thomas Conan, who's, a, who's an outstanding clinician. And of those that we saw, we found that two thirds of all of the spontaneous dislocated IOLs within the bag were, um, were found to have associated pseudoxfoliation. And what was interesting about that is they only recognized about half of them ahead of time. And this is a department chairman, outstanding clinician. And so sometimes the findings of exfoliation syndrome can be quite subtle. So we were very surprised when we found out that actually half of the ones had unrecognized exfoliation syndrome. And so, you know, here in Utah, um, of the ones that we see here, it is somewhere between 50 and probably 66% of all cases of spontaneous dislocation of an IOL within the bag or associated with exfoliation. Yeah, wow, that, that's incredible. But it definitely matches with our clinical experience. Patients who come in with a spontaneous dislocation of their IOL and with no prior history, no, no IOP spikes, and no obvious signs, of phenotypic signs of pseudoexfoliation. So in any case, uh, one of the challenges that we have with uh, fixating these IOLs is what techniques do we have available? Uh, in, historically, we've used non-absorbable sutures, typically EPTFE or also known as Gore-Tex. Um, or polypropylene. Uh, yes, for in, in, in full disclosure, Gore-Tex on its on its packaging says not for ophthalmic use, and I think they're just trying to cover themselves. Uh, but many people have found that this is really one of the gold standard sutures that we use for non-absorbable sutures for scleral fixation, whether it be for IOLs, CTRs, or uh, capsular retention segments. And finally, we have the double flange Yamani technique, which many of us have adopted in order to fixate um, patients who uh, fixate lenses that don't have capsular bags. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that, you know, this polypropylene technique has been something that's uh, evolved over the last several years, um, primarily since Shin described his double flange technique, Conabrava, McCabe, Mahler, et al. Many have actually described using um, polypropylene suture and flanging it for scleral fixation. Uh, recently in JCRS, uh, last a couple of years ago, there was a nice series by Ehud Asia 
uh, on the 6 polypropylene flange technique. There's a part one and a part two series. Uh, I, I encourage you guys to read it. It's his case series uh, talking about the outcomes uh, of his particular population, but also goes into some of the fundamentals of how to use 6 polypropylene suture. Um, so now I'm gonna just switch to a different screen here. Just this video is gonna be better suited. So now I'm gonna let this play. This is a patient uh, probably, I wanna say around mid seventies to late seventies with a spontaneously dislocated IOL. Uh, I'm using an optical zone marker here, or sorry, a Mendez ring in order to mark the visual access. Uh, this is prior to dilation, or maybe the patient received one set of drops, but wasn't dilating very well. Uh, another clue that this was likely related to suit exfoliation. You can't see the video, Dr. Chaya. Oh, okay. Let me see. Um, it's still on the original one. Okay. Let me just get out of this. Let me share again. Is that better? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so this is a Mendez ring that I'm using to mark the visual access. And I'm gonna mark my zero and 180, but I still don't know exactly how this lens was oriented in terms of where the haptic optic junction is. Um, this patient actually, just a little bit more feedback about, this is actually a patient who has a prior bleb. Um, I, I, I mistakenly forgot to add that as part of the uh, history. You can see he has a shallow bleb here superiorly. So a patient with known pseudoexfoliation um, who had a bleb, existing bleb, uh, with a spontaneous dislocation of his IOL. So viscoelastic is injected. I'm gonna make my main incision. And then in a little bit, we'll play some iris hooks just to understand I knew that the lens was not a toric lens, so I wasn't as concerned about having to maintain the orientation to maintain the astigmatism correction. Uh, so my plan was to fixate the lens at the horizontal meridian in order to avoid trauma to the blood. And so what we're gonna do here is we're, after we create our incisions, I'm gonna just advance this a little bit. We're gonna place our iris hooks in order to be able to locate the haptic optic junction. So I don't think there's anything wrong with using a Mel Eugen ring in this instance, but I do like iris hooks um, just to be able to sequentially move them where I need them. And sometimes I don't need all four. Sometimes I just need to have enough exposure to be able to see where the haptics are. So maybe I'll just pause here for a moment and then just open it up to the group again about what would their preferred technique be for suturing a capsular bag IOL complex here. Or if you would even maintain this lens, uh, certainly there's a good argument to say, why not just remove the entire bag and start all over with the uh, Yamani technique or another scleral fixation technique of choice. Hey, uh, Craig, it's, it's uh, Randy again. I mean, <laughs> it's been a while since I was actively surgically engaged, but uh, uh, I used to leave these and uh, would suture my making sure that I lasso the haptics in the bag and suture the bag haptic complex. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, bring it back in um, under a, a, a little Hoffman pocket so that the sutures were hidden down. And uh, I followed those patients, you know, for, I've now got some 10, 15 years. They were, they were very stable. I used to use uh, nine uh, you know, polypropylene, but uh, um, we know even that sometimes will degrade. So I think the Teflon would also work, but I, I, that's, I don't see many people doing that anymore, but uh, it was, I, I thought it was quite effective and uh, it, you know, minimize the amount of surgery needed because you just had to place the sutures. And I know people complain how hard it is sometimes to get those sutures through the capsule and some secondary cataract. So I would always put a sharp needle uh, from the outside 
and they use my suture needle uh, against that sharp opening so that that you could you know between the two control exactly where the capsule was and pass then the needle through the capsule underneath the haptic and then um, into the opening of the needle and and bring it out inside of a Hoffman pocket. And you just had to do the other one as well. And that lassoed it and brought it in in good position. So an old technique. I, I know I don't hear many people talking about it anymore, but uh, certainly the the patients that I'm still following that I've seen, they look good and stable. So, Right. Yeah. As um, Dr. Hoffman, you alluded to this Hoffman pocket technique. For those of you that don't know what a Hoffman pocket is, essentially you're making a, making a limbal groove and then dissecting posteriorly uh, with a crescent blade back uh, to make a pocket. Uh, then as you suture your complex, those sutures are passing through the pocket and you'll use a snare, either a Kuklin hook or micro forceps in order to be able to externalize the sutures on top of the cornea where you'll tie your knots and then advance them down into the pocket. Uh, so the advantage of a Hopkin pocket is it allows you to not have to create a pyridomy and to be able to bury the knots of the sutures uh, easily. Others? I'll go ahead and let the video play here. Again, uh, we're identifying... Like my video is frozen, give me just a second. And so here you can see that the haptic bulb is here. And so I have a good sense now of where this haptic optic junction is. Uh, but because I mentioned that this patient had a superior bleb, um, I'm prepared to have to rotate the entire bag complex. Uh, we're performing a limited anterior vitrectomy here just to make sure there's no vitreous in the anterior chamber. A little bit of vitreous stain just to look as well. And then just to ensure that there's nothing entrapping uh, the complex. Now I'm going to grab the edge of the capsule in order to bring it back towards the center. I'll use a push pull here as well. And here I can see the other location of the haptic optic junction. And I brought that up above the iris plane uh, in order to just secure it um, a little bit. And then I'll reposition the iris hooks. I'm um, actually trying to get this in the capsule itself to hold it in place, uh, but it's not very successful. The capsule is quite fibrotic, and I just don't have enough space there in that location. Putting viscoelastic behind the lens in order to give me a little bit of safety in case the whole lens complex wants to drift. Replace the iris hooks, and now I'm going to be marking the sclerotomies in the horizontal meridian. My first anterior most sclerotomy is roughly two millimeters from the end of the blue gray zone. And then the second uh, sclerotomy marking is three and a half millimeters back from the blue gray zone. Uh, then we'll cut a piece of suture off, the 6O proline. Uh, we don't need a needle for the, uh, the needle on the suture for this. Uh, we're just simply going to place, uh, place it in the eye and dock it into these needles. I'm bending the thin walled 30 gauge needle. This is the same one that we use for the Yamani technique. And the suture is placed in the eye from an opposite paracentesis. This patient's having a little bit of difficulty, so we'll do a, just, a, I think, a cut down here in order to give him a subtenons injection. And so. so I like to make the first pass posteriorly, so I'm cradling the lens from posteriorly. Just in case the lens wants to drop back, I have an option to levitate. So I'm going to go perpendicular to the sclera and then flatten off. Then I'm going to locate where the haptic optic junction is. And with counter traction, use a micro forceps in order to puncture through the haptic optic junction. The 6O proline suture is then docked into the needle and then externalized. I think what's important here, though, is as you externalize the needle, 
you do still have to maintain some counter on the lens. Otherwise, you could just continue to tear off more zonules. So a little bit of gentle counter traction there. And then that suture is externalized and then flanged. Now, personally, I prefer a larger flange just to make sure that those flanges are visible, but flush with the sclera and definitely buried underneath the conjunct type and tenons as well, ideally. And the other end of the suture is then folded on itself and brought back into the same paracentesis. And then we'll go through the anterior most sclerotomy here uh, with the same needle perpendicular to the sclera. As soon as you puncture through, then you can level off. And then docking that suture into the needle. So this needle has not passed through. It's simply just in the sulcal space above the eyewall complex. And then we'll remove the uh, other end of the loop. So that's one end of the complex. And then we'll repeat the same thing on the opposite side. Again, folding over, docking the anterior most. One of the advantages I like about this technique is rather than simply lassoing around the haptic, where there could be a risk of having the suture slide off the haptic as it cheese wires through the bag complex. Uh, this is very secure. You're going through the actual lens material itself through the haptic optic junction. And then here you can adjust the tension on both ends of the suture in order to get the center, the, the Iowa bag complex as close to the center as possible. And I will flange the anterior most at the very end and adjust. And what I'm looking for is kind of a snapback sign that as I put tension on the suture, and here I'm constantly just adjusting and trimming. Uh, and I, I do this multiple times in order to get the right tension that I need. Here, we'll make sure that that's buried underneath. And then we'll do the same thing to the opposite side. I haven't figured, this is really just more art than anything and just a feel for how much suture you need to trim off. There is a theoretical risk that you could pull the polypropylene too hard and actually cheese wire through the haptic optic junction. Um, but I think it's a lot tougher to do with 6-0 proline. I actually feel like it's more, more likely to happen with a thinner caliber suture uh, where you can actually cheese wire through the lens material. But 6-0 proline is quite sturdy. And there we've, we've done our double flanges for both sides. And then we're now removing our iris hooks. A little bit of anterior vitrectomy at the end just to make sure there's nothing that has uh, prolapsed. We'll suture the incision and the case is completed here. Uh, so in summary, you know, the 6 proline technique, polypropylene flange technique has been used in a variety of techniques, not only to fixate an IOL bag complex, uh, it's been used for capsular tension rings uh, or cap capsular tension segments. It's also been used in iris reconstruction uh, for irritated analysis, repair, cycloanalysis, clefts. And also I've been using the same similar technique, the 6 polypropylene flange technique for uh, iris prostheses as well. So a very versatile technique. Are there some issues or some cases where maybe I wouldn't want to use this technique? I think uh, patients, if they're very astute, they may notice the small blue rivets uh, above the sclera. And for some patients that are, that could be cosmetically uh, unacceptable for patients. And so maybe uh, EPTFE or Gore-Tex suture would be more appropriate for those patients where um, hiding the suture color would be most important. Now, I have found that it, these are very small flanges. I don't want to give you the impression that these are like massive blue dots on the sclera that are noticeable across the room. You really have to get close, and I think even with a slit lamp to be able to see them in detail. Um, but these are things that need to be followed over time. Um, Liliana had a nice editorial a while back talking about some of the complications that can occur with this flange technique, and one of them is conjunctival erosion and nephthalmitis. So I do think it's important to be meticulous in how you how you how you flange these. I, I do think that a little bit tighter to get that snapback sign where you see the flange pulling back into the sclera is essential. 
uh, to keep these flanges from eroding through the overlying conjunctiva. But overall, uh, since I've used this technique in the last six years for a variety of techniques, both for Marfan's work and uh, Irish reconstruction, I have not seen any conjunctival erosions uh, at all. But I do think that you need to be prepared to uh, address those as they come and make sure patients are aware that if they notice any injection, foreign body sensation, um, irritation, that they be evaluated promptly in order to make sure that that complication is not occurring. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to entertain any questions or uh, discuss um, this technique further or other techniques. Mm -hmm.